Hello world, it's Siraj, and in this episode, we're gonna talk about TensorBoard. TensorBoard is a data visualization tool that comes packaged with TensorFlow. TensorFlow programs can range from super simple, like an addition problem, to super complex using thousands of computations. And they all have two basic components, operations and tensors. The idea is that you create a model that consists of a set of operations, feed data or tensors into the model, and the tensors will flow between operations until you get an output tensor, which is your result. TensorBoard was created as a way to help you understand the flow of tensors in your model so that you can debug and optimize it. We're gonna visualize a classifier that can recognize handwritten digits in TensorBoard. We'll use two examples of the classifier. One is a simple version in 60 lines of Python, and the other is a more complex version. Python, I love you. Don't worry if you don't understand every line of code. We just want to get a general sense of what's happening under the hood so that we can later understand the TensorBoard visualizations. Here, we go. We'll start by importing TensorFlow in our input data class, which pulls our training data from the web. Then we'll define two helper functions. Init weights will return a variable that contains randomly generated weight values along a normal distribution. Our second helper function will create our model, a three layer feed forward neural network. We're gonna create three layers and define them via the namescope function. The namescope function creates high level namespaces for operations in the TensorFlow graph that we will later visualize. In each layer, we'll run a dropout function and an activation function. Dropout is a function that forces our neural network to learn several different representations of patterns so that generalization improves. The activation function creates probabilities out of numbers. So now that we have our two helper functions, we can create variables to store our training and testing images as well as our training and testing labels. Next, we can create input and output placeholders for our data. Then we'll initialize our weights between each of the three layers using the function we defined earlier. We'll define histogram summaries for each of our weights so we can visualize the distribution of weights later in TensorBoard. The next step is to add dropout placeholders to our hidden and input layers. We can then create our model using the variables we've created. Now that that we have our model, we'll create our cost function. The cost function is a measure of how good a neural net is with respect to its given training sample and the expected output. We want it to decrease over time. We'll also measure the accuracy of the network. We want that to increase over time. We'll later visualize both. Next, we'll create a session to run our graph computation. In our session, we'll save our model using the summary writer. Lastly, we'll initialize our variables for training and train our model. That's it. I know that was really fast, unlike series comprehension. You heard me, Apple. Let's visualize that code in TensorBoard and I'll explain it more. Summary operations are how TensorBoard acquires data from our TensorFlow runs. They are functions like tf.matrixmultiply. We created a number of them in our code. Here in the events tab, we can view our scalar summaries, accuracy and cost. The x-axis shows the time steps and the y-axis shows the accuracy measure or the percentage of correct predictions over time. We can blow up our graph for a closer look or view a wider range of data points by expanding the y-axis. We can also drag a rectangle on our graph to zoom in on a certain region if we like and double click to zoom out. As we mouse over the chart, it will produce crosshairs with data values. We can change how smooth our line is by adjusting the slider. The step option shows time steps. The relative option shows the time relative to the first data point. That means the number of minutes or hours since the training run was started. And the wall option shows the actual time the runs happened. We can create more tags as well in the sidebar. It can either be an entirely new tag or a tag that will group a bunch of existing summaries together into a new category. Let's switch to a more complex version of our handwritten character classifier example with even more scalar summaries. We can type in, it's over 9,000. And since no summary contains those terms, it becomes a new category. But if we look under max and mean, they both contain summaries for biases. So if we type in biases, it will create a new category that contains both biases from these two existing categories. We can also download our graphs in CSV or JSON format. For this more complex example, we have lines for both training and testing data. That way we can compare runs. Let's move on to images. We created an image summary. This lets us view the images in both the training and testing folder. Okay, let's switch back to our simple classifier and move on to the graphs tab, which lets us inspect our TF model. We can see each of the three layers we created via the namescope function. Let's double click on one of our layer namespaces to expand it. The first thing that pops out is the dropout function, which we declared inside of the scope, as well as our relu and matrix multiply functions. Notice the arrows from both nodes pointing to the cost operation. The direction of the arrows shows the direction that the tensors are flowing. Our two placeholder operation nodes, x and p keep input hidden, which is used for the dropout function, serve as entry points for our tensors. They move through each of the three layers, through the weights, into the cost function every time, eventually to the accuracy function, and finally to the output placeholder that gives us our prediction. To reduce clutter, TensorFlow automatically shows nodes with many connections to other nodes in their own area to view in detail. If we wanted to, we can add them back to the main graph by clicking the add to main graph button in the detail card. Yo, um, bringing it back. Let's take a look at the sidebar. We can choose which run we want to display, train or test, and show the graph at each time step. The color option lets us see at each time step what structures are being used, which device each operation is running on, compute time along a scale, and memory usage. We can also manually upload a saved TensorFlow graph right from the UI if we'd like. Let's move on to distributions. We created histograms
histogram summaries for all three of our weights between layers, and we can view the distribution of each weight here. Let's switch to our complex classifier. The light part shows all the weights across time, and the shaded parts shows those weights that are actually activated during training. These curves represent percentiles, like the max and mean and median. The histogram plot allows us to plot any variables we like from our graph. It's showing how the values of our weights change with training. Isn't it beautiful? TensorBoard lets you visualize your data so you can debug and optimize it. You can create summary operations in your TensorFlow program, which takes tensors as inputs and produces outputs. TensorBoard reads these summaries and displays them visually. The challenge for this video is to create a TensorFlow program that visualizes audio data in some way. The winner gets a shout out from me in two episodes. More info and links in the description. Please subscribe for more ML videos. And for now, I've got to go get some sunlight. So thanks for watching.